right. So today's class again, the where we're at in this in the in the semester is again we're we're going down the stack. The the last three classes were all about doing query optimization, right? How do you take a SQL query, parse it, put it into a to a, a logical form, then generate an optimized uh, physical plan for it with the lowest cost. And now that we have our physical plan, now we need to actually execute it. So though, so our focus today is first talk about at a high level the different process models you can have in uh, in a database system. And for those of you who took the inter interruption class, this should be somewhat uh, sh this should be a review. And then we'll talk about uh, the different types of query parallelization, parallelization we can deal with. And then we'll focus on at the end doing data placement and and scheduling, which is sort of the, the key thing that you guys read in the paper in the, the hyper paper on on the morsel system. Okay. All right. So again, this should should everyone should be uh, at the same level of where we're at in, in in understanding our conceptual model of the database system. So we're given a SQL query, and then we uh, we generate the logical operators, and then the query query optimizer will then produce physical operators for those logical ones. Um, but then now with these physical operators, we now want to actually execute them. And instead of just executing, you know, one thread or one task per physical operator, we can take that physical operator and run multiple uh, invocations of it or instances of it at the same time uh, in parallel. So we're going to say an operator instance is an invocation of a physical operator that's going to process some segment of data. Right, the high level idea here is that in modern, uh, in modern systems, we have multiple cores. So rather than just running everything, you know, all the operators in your query plan, one core at a, or one, one operator at a time on a single core, we can run these in parallel. So even though it's going to be the same high-level physical operator that we're executing, they're going to run on multiple cores on, and, and process different parts of the database or the tables or the intermediate results of another operator. So what we'll do is we'll define a task now in our system is going to be a sequence of one or more operator instances that we're going to execute as part of a, a, a single request. So again, we take our physical plan, we're going to, we're going to convert them into uh, uh, to, to operator instances that we're going to run in, in, in multiple threads, but then we may want to pipeline a bunch of them together and schedule these, that, that, that sequence of those operators in our system, and we'll call that a, as a task. And so this is not, I would say, a task is not a uh, universal definition. This is what I'm going to use for this lecture. All right, different textbooks, different papers might refer to these things as fragments or, or, or um, pieces of the query. Right? There's, there's no one standard definition that everyone uses. So now we want to talk about how we're actually going to run the system, uh, or how we're going to build our database system to use all the uh, additional cores that we have uh, available to us. Again, this course is all about single node shared everything or shared memory systems. So we're not worrying about how do we you know, spread the system across multiple, multiple nodes. But at a high level, a distributed database is essentially going to work the same way. Right? At every single node, you have to have one of these, one of these process models. So the process model is going to define how the system is going to be built so that we can handle concurrent requests from multiple, multiple users at the same time. Right? It doesn't necessarily have to be multiple users. Uh, it could be a single request that we can then split up into different tasks and run them in parallel. But the high-level idea is the same. So what we'll do is we're going to define a logical concept in our database system, system called a worker that is going to be responsible in our system for executing tasks on behalf of the client. And then it takes those tasks and those tasks produce results. And then you need to send them back in a coalesced form back to the, to the client that requested it. So again, at a high level, SQL query comes in. We can break it up into multiple tasks. We run those in parallel. But in each of those tasks, we're going to generate some subset of the output. But then we need to combine them and send back the result as, as a single form or a, a single collection of data to, to the client. So, there is essentially three ways you can build your uh, a database system of different process models. So what I'll say also too that this is sort of uh, I'm using the term process models. Uh, it's it's a bit of an overloaded term in systems. For this process model, again, think of the high level architecture of the system. One way you can implement a process model 
is through processes, like at, at, at an operating system level. So just, just be mindful of this as we go along. So the first approach is to have a process per database worker. Uh, then we can have a process pool, and then we can have a thread for, per database worker. And I'll go through examples of each of these. So in the process per worker model, uh, this is actually the, oh, the oldest approach, the most common approach used in systems that were built in the 70s and 80s and much of the 90s. Um, but every single database system worker in, 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 our, in our system is going to run as a separate process. Like if you run fork or exec inside your operating system, you get, you get a standalone process. So the, the high level idea is that our application comes along, uh, it's going to send a query request, and it's always going to go through some front end process called the dispatcher or the coordinator. And then this thing's responsible for, for then handing off the request to a worker process will then do uh, whatever it needs to do to execute it, and it will also communicate directly with the, with the, the, the application. But it can send then, the, the, execute the request now in the data system, get back results, and then send back the, uh, directly through the, to the application without having to go through the dispatcher. Um, so there's a couple of things to say about this. So one is that uh, the, the, the database system is not going to do any scheduling on its own. All the scheduling is going to be handled by the operating system. Right? The operating system has its own uh, scheduling protocol and decides how to, to time slice resources. The data system essentially just punts all that uh, decision making to the operating system. Now you can do some things like pass flags, like nice or IO nice to say uh, you know, what priority a process is given, but at, at, the, the, at a real fine grained detail, we don't control anything. The other thing too is also now, because these are running a separate processes, they're each gonna have their own private address space, so if we want to have shared uh, data structures across multiple processes, we have to use shared memory, right? Because otherwise, you, know, if, if you would have uh, every worker process would have its own copy of the database because it's running in, in, in its local address space. So otherwise, you have to send IPC requests between, between them to pass around messages, or you can use shared memory as a, as a, as a place to store of, uh, global data structure. One benefit you get from this is that, uh, although you don't typically you don't want this to happen in your database system, you want your database database system to be you know, resilient, high quality engineering, and reliable as possible. But bad things happen. Um, the nice advantage of this approach is that if, if one of these worker guys goes awry and crashes, you don't end up taking down the entire system, right? Only that one process fails. So this is the approach that's used in, as I said, in most of the data systems that were built in the in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, um, DB2, Oracle, and Postgres do this. Like in Postgres, this thing's called the Postmaster. Right? If you're running Postgres on your laptop and you look at top, right, to see the different processes that are running, one of them will, will be la labeled as the Postmaster. Right? And the reason why uh, these systems use this approach is because when they were being developed in the 80s and 90s, P threads weren't as, you know, as, as, uh, widespread as they are now, right? Every Linux installation, you have the POSIX threads available to you. Back then, there was all these different variants of Unix, right? There was HPOX, True64, BSD, Linux was still a bit early, Solaris. All these systems had their own threading packages. So if you wrote your data system for HPOX uh, and you used threads, it may not actually work, end up working on Solaris or HPOX or, or, or True64, <clears throat> right? So for portability reasons, uh, they would use this approach because every single system, every single uh, Unix would have fork and shared memory. So you could be sure that that feature was available everywhere. Another approach is to use the process pool. Uh, and this is, again, this is like the, 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 the previous example I just showed, except that um, instead of having a dedicated worker handle your, your, your connection and the, the, the application only interact with that worker, the application can send a request to the dispatcher, and the dispatcher can then hand it off to a to any three pro free process in the worker pool, and the worker pool the worker can then execute things and send things back through uh, the dispatcher. So this is still going to rely on shared memory because again these are running as separate processes. It's still going to rely on uh, on um, the OS to schedule everything uh, because again we we can't control this. But the advantage is that now you can sort of uh, 
you can be a bit more flexible in how you're, 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 you're breaking up queries into tasks because now one worker could decide, oh, well, I don't want to be, I want to execute this query in parallel across multiple cores. Uh, so maybe I'll hand, hand, hand off a task to another worker if it's free, and it can execute that and then send me back the results, and I, I can combine things. Uh, so this is actually how Postgres is, is, is pushing, uh, moving more towards uh, this approach. Uh, in Postgres 9.5, they started adding support to do parallel queries, uh, again, running queries on, on multiple cores, and essentially they were doing this approach. And I think as of Postgres 10, uh, they have a bit more aggressive uh, strategy for doing this. So I think most queries now can run uh, across multiple workers. And then, of course, IBM DB2 does this as well. As we'll see in the next slide, DB2 basically has to support everything because not only do they need to support commodity hardware, like you know, Amazon EC2 instances or you know, just regular uh, Linux or Windows machines, but they also need to support uh, ZOS or the really expensive mainframes that IBM sells. So DB2 has to run in every possible environment. So as the administrator, you can set uh, what you want DB2 to run at. Um, I actually think, I think for ZOS, it has to run as, as the, the process, per, process per worker. Um, but on regular Linux, they can run on the, in, the, in the thread per worker approach. All right, and the last one is the most common one. Uh, as, as far as I know, every single database that's been built in the last 15 years is going to use the uh, thread per worker or the multi-threaded approach. And this is because pthreads are now widely available. Um, and you know that if you write you know, in pthreads on one machine, uh, it should work on any other machine that your, your, your system can compile on. And actually, as of uh, C++, I think, uh, 11, now they have SCD thread. Now they sort of they have a standard definition of what a thread actually is, whereas before it was just pthreads. So now with the, you know, uh, a worker, uh, these worker threads, now we can send our request to some collection of worker threads running the database system, and either one of these can, uh, can process our, our query and send back results. So for this now, now we're going to see that the data system is going to have to do its own scheduling for a lot of things because uh, we control everything. So we have to be careful now about where we're going to run our, 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 our threads and what those threads are actually going to do. Um, the one thing I'll point out, though, is just because uh, you're using a multi-threaded process to execute queries doesn't mean you automatically get multi-threaded uh, query parallelism. Right? So MySQL uses this approach, but as, at least as of MySQL 5.7, I, I haven't checked MySQL 8, um, they actually run everything as a single thread. So if a query shows up, one thread will execute it from beginning to end. They can't split it across uh, multiple threads, whereas Postgres is starting to add that. Um, and Oracle as of 2014 adds all these things. And the SQL Server, as far as I know, is entirely uh, multi-threaded. So again, the main takeaways of this is that the, the multi-threaded approach has several advantages. Um, in particular, there's less overhead for a context switch because everything is always in the same address space. So you don't have to load in security information going from one process to the next. Um, you don't have to manage shared memory. right? We just assume everything's in the same address space, and, and we're fine. Um, but you do have to be a little more careful and make sure that your code is a bit more robust because now if one thread does something bad, you can take down the whole thing. Um, whereas in, in, in a the process process model, as a uh, process per worker model, uh, you don't have this problem. And like I said, I don't think anybody, I would even, I would even extend this to 15 years, nobody uses uh, the, the process model, the process per worker model, except for systems that are based on Postgres. So Postgres is based on the, uh, the second approach, the, the process pool. Process pool. Uh, so any system that is derived from Postgres, things like Greenplum, Teza, Vertica, these are all uh, going to be inherent the architecture that Postgres used. And in fact, when we started building, building Peloton, we were also based on Postgres. Uh, and so we had this problem of we were, had, you know, we, we were using a process per worker. And we wanted to get away from that because we wanted to be able to do multi-threaded queries. So the first summer when we started working on the system, we basically went through and rewrote the, the, our system based on Postgres to use multiple threads instead of multiple processes and got rid of shared memory entirely. Um, and th that, this is another conversation for another time. It turns out the way to actually do this in Postgres that made it actually much easier than we thought it was going to be is that if you take the, the, the Windows code for Postgres that makes it multi-process. 
with some minor changes, you can actually make it use POSIX threads. And then the way it, it was actually architected made it much easier to be multi-threaded than we thought it was going to be. Um, but that was actually one surprise. OK, so now that we have our process model, now we, we, can, we understand how the system can be architected, how the workers are going to execute. Uh, now we've got to think about how we're actually going to schedule our queries, or how, uh, the tasks inside them. So for, the, for every single query plan that shows up, we're going to have to decide where, when, and how to execute it. So the how is how many tasks we should use for it, right? How, many, how, how much should we divide up the query and try to run the different parts of it in, in parallel? Um, and then how many cores we should use to execute those tasks? Because it's not a one-to-one -one mapping. You can have more tasks than cores or more cores than tasks. Depends on what, what you want to do. And then when we say we have these tasks, now we need to decide what CPU cores uh, they should execute on and where should the output of, of the task like its intermediate result from the operator, where should we store them so that the next task that may need to consume them can find them? And the main takeaway that I'm saying here, as, as I said throughout, throughout all the semester, is that the database system is always going to be able to do a better job than the operating system because it knows exactly what, what the query is actually trying to do. Right? The operating system just sees a bunch of threads that, that want to get scheduled and run, but it doesn't know anything about what those threads are actually trying to do. But inside the data system, we know what query we're executing. We know what, what's in our, our query plan and our operators. So we can be more fine-grained and more uh, uh, have better control and get, end, up, end up getting better results because we know exactly what our, our query plan is going to do. So again, this is the main theme about this and, and throughout the entire semester. We can always do a better job than the operating system. So there's, there's two types of parallelism uh, we can talk about. So the first one we're not, we're not going to mention too much is because we've already talked about this before when we talked about concurrent control. So this is called inter-query parallelism. Right? Can we run multiple queries in parallel at the same time? Again, with concurrent control, we said that this, was, this is what the, that, that, that those protocols provide for us because they're going to allow multiple transactions to run at the same time, update the database at the same time, under the illusion that they're running by themselves. Uh, and we just have to figure out how to schedule their, their, their operators such that they don't um, that, that they, they don't interfere with each other and cause uh, acid violations. So the one thing I'll say is, as far as I know, the how hard it's going to be to actually implement a concurrent control scheme is not going to be uh, greatly affected by what process model we use. So whether we're using a, a per proce a per process per worker or the multi-threaded approach, you know, a thread per worker approach. It doesn't make two-phase locking or uh, timestamp ordering or, or MVCC any, any easier or harder, right? All the same challenges that we had to deal with before, like how to identify conflicts, make sure that things end up in the right order, these are all, all going to be the same. So again, there's not much really to say, say about this because we already covered this with concurrent control. The thing we're really going to focus on uh, in this class and going forward for most of the rest of the semester is how to do intro query parallelism. Again, the idea is that we're taking a single query and we want to execute as operators in parallel to improve performance because we have the resources in order to do this. So there's a big difference between uh, you know, modern systems versus the things that, you know, data systems in the 1970s and 1980s. Back then you had a uniprocessor, you had a single socket with a single core, uh, but now we have multiple sockets and multiple cores per socket. So Figuring out the right way to actually schedule these things and, and divide queries up is, is really uh, is important. So the first type of parallelism, you can have intro query parallelism, is called intro operator parallelism or horizontal parallelism. And the idea here is that we're going to take our operator and we're going to uh, break them up into independent instances that are each to perform the same function just on different parts of, of the data that we're trying to consume. And then the other approach is do inter operator par uh, parallelism. So this is intra-query, inter-operator parallelism, and this is sort of, sort of also called vertical parallelism. And the idea is that we can run operators in the same query plan at the same time in a pipeline fashion so that you don't have to wait for, one operator doesn't need to wait for the, 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 the guy below it to process all its data before it can start processing. And we'll, we'll go through examples of each of these. So in the case of the first one, if we do intra-operator parallelism, Again, the idea here is that we're going to run multiple instances of the same operator at the same time. So let's say we have a really simple query. 
we want to join A and B on AID, but then we have two small little filters here uh, on A.value and B.value. So if we want to generate now the actual execution plan for this uh, uh, query plan, we say we start with A, and A is a large table, so we can break it up into three segments. Uh, these can be called partitions or shards or chunks, or in the case of the hyperpaper, they call these morsels, right? Some sub disjoint subset of, of the table, excuse, excuse me, of the table. And let's say that we can divide up A into to three blocks or three chunks, and then we're going to assign a CPU core to be dedicated for executing uh, executing this operator instance on this segment of the data. And again, it doesn't matter whether this is a process or a thread. At a high level, the idea is the same. So now, the next thing we see is that we want the after we scan A, we're going to do the filter uh, in, in our where clause. So we can actually do, uh, immediately take the output of this and run it through our, our filter. And so this will be sort of this will be sort of now treated as a single task that will get scheduled at at the single core here. Then likewise, we have the uh, projection at the top, so we can just add this uh, above this. And because we know now we're also going to do a join, uh, we can have them each build a, a hash table here. So what I'm not showing is, is what the hash table actually looks like in terms of what the data structure is, but also I'm not showing whether each task is building a, a subset of the hash table or whether it's a global hash table. That'll be our focus on, on Wednesday, right, uh, when we talk about hash joins. But for now, just assume that they're building a global one, right? And how they synchronize, we'll, we'll, we'll worry about that later. So the thing, though, is now we need to know that when each of these tasks finish, uh, we need to know when they're finished so that we can then start scheduling other, other tasks in the system. So to do this, we're going to add a, a sort of a virtual operator called the exchange operator. And this is sort of like a barrier that says the query plan cannot proceed further up into the, the, the plan. The execution cannot proceed until all of the subtasks that come below this exchange finish. So the exchange operator came from uh, the Volcano project. Again, the same Volcano guy that did Cascades uh, that we talked about last week. It's the same Volcano guy that did the iterator model for query processing, right? Um, so the exchange operator is again is, is sort of a, a junction point where you can you make sure that all the tasks that are feeding into this have to complete before you do anything else. Again, you can think of this as a pipeline breaker when we talked about query compilation as well. All right. So and let's say in this case here, once we have all the results for the exchange operator, right, then we can feed it up into the the build side of the join because now we have the the hash table we're going to use to probe. So now, once this is complete, then we can start firing off uh, operated instances to do the scan on B. And again, let's just assume that we can break this up into three chunks or three morsels. Um, and then they're each going to do the uh, filter plus, plus the projection. And then now they can do the probe into the hash table that these guys built. So for this, we don't need an exchange operator here because at this point here, we're this these tasks here will be blocked until this thing finishes. So we know at this point here, once this exchange operator is done, the hash table is complete. So therefore, there won't be any false negatives. Right? Everything that we expect to be from A should be in a hash table. So now we can just do our, do our probe into it and find our results. Right? But again, we can do this now also in parallel as well. They don't need to synchronize at all. Because each of these are operating on an independent segment of B, and you don't need to know what's in these other segments uh, in order to, to do your probe. But now we also need now an exchange operator above this, because this join operator is spitting out tuples, and we want to be able to combine them uh, into a single result and then produce the output to the application. So this is clear, what we're talking about when we say operator instance. All right? We're taking what was a scan on A, and running it in, in, in parallel across three cores. OK, so now interoperator parallelism, uh, again, the idea here is that the, we're going to allow one operator to run uh, in one thread, 
while other operators below it are also running at the same time. And they're all sort of emitting tuples and pushing them up into the, uh, into, into the query event or pooling, depending on how you're looking at it. And they don't need to coordinate. They don't need, other than knowing that they have to block until the other guy uh, below it produces the tuples that it needs. Right? So let's just take the join here. The join could be running on one core, and it's just doing a, a really simple nest, nested loop join. And it's just taking all the data that's getting from the guys below it, uh, and then just doing the join comparison, and then emitting tuples up. And then above this, we have the uh, projection that, again, this is just spinning on another core that's running, uh, taking all the output that comes from the guy below it, does the projection, and then spit it up. And then if there's anything above it in the query plan, that, that can run as a separate thread and process as well. So again, the idea here is that this thing essentially needs to block until it knows, uh, until this guy spits, spits something else, right? So you, as far as I know, you typically don't see this in, uh, in traditional relational database systems. Uh, you see this in stream processing systems, like the stream uh, system from, from last week, or like things like uh, Storm or Heron, um, because these are going to be running on separate nodes, and they're sort of pushing data out all the time continuously. Um, as far as I know, no you know, relational data system that supports you know, SQL do, does, does this approach here. Everyone does the other approach with in, intro operator parallelism. All right. So now the issue is going to be how are we going to come up with the, the right number of workers we're going to use for a query plan. Um, and this really depends on the environment that our query is running in. So it's going to depend on the number of cores we have or number of threads that are available to us, the size of the data that, that we, we expect to, to process, um, and then what those operators are actually doing. So for some queries, like an OLTP query, it doesn't make sense to do any of this parallelism stuff because it's going to do an index probe to find one query or find one tuple in the index and then spit it up. Uh, to the query plan and produce it back to the application, right? It's not doing complex joins, it's not doing complex aggregations or window functions. So this really is focusing on OLAP queries and it depends on what our environment looks like. So the first question we gotta deal with is how we're gonna allocate or assign workers to our, our, our CPU cores. So the first approach is to have one worker per core. Um, and this is basically you have you know, a fixed number of, of cores in your system and you have one thread be dedicated to uh, that one core, and no other thread can run to that core at the same time. Um, this is what we used in HStore and VoltDB. Um, this is what the Morsel do approach does, does as well. So the way you actually can do this is that there's a syscall you can make called sked set, set affinity, um, where you can tell the operating system for my, for my thread, here's, here's the, the, the CPU IDs that I'm allowed to run on. So what you basically do is for each worker thread, you say, all right, you run on, on one, and the next guy says, I run on two. And then you're basically providing a mask to say, what are the threads, you, what are the cores that these threads can't run on? So you prevent anybody else from getting scheduled on, on that core, and you have dedicated access to this. Um, the other approach is to do multiple workers per core. And this is what the HANA guys are going to do when, when we talk about it later on. And the idea here is that we're going to have a pool of workers uh, that would be assigned to uh, as either a single core or a single socket. Uh, usually it's on, on a per socket basis. And then all the other, uh, this allows any of these workers to be able to run on, on either the, the core or the socket at any given time. So the advantage of this is that if you have a, your worker get blocked because of network IO or disk IO or something, then rather than you know, no other uh, thread being able to use that core, because it's, in this case here, you'd be the only guy pinned to it, you allow some other thread to do some other task that, that's useful, the, the OS can schedule it, uh, rather than just having that core essentially be idle. So the HANA guys are going to claim that this is actually the better approach to do when you have a, a large number of sockets uh, with a large number of cores, and you want to export mixed workloads. Again, in the case of HDROM VoltDB, we did this one because we were always in memory and we never had our worker threads stall on, on I.O., either network I.O. or disk I.O. Right? There was other threads running the system that would handle networking and logging and things like that. But when it came time to actually a worker actually executing a, a transaction, it would never be blocked by anything. Right? It, was, it was almost running at, at bare metal speed. 
Okay. All right. So then the uh, another thing I also say about this too is the the control the, this control here only matters to your process, the data system process. So if there's something else running on the system, like someone's doing Bitcoin mining, right? That's outside the control of the data system. It can use any any cores that it, that it wants, right? Unless you have administrative privileges and go out and block every every other process from using your cores. Um, this will prevent other threads within your process from running on this core, uh, but it won't prevent other processes from running this core as well. But again, if you have a, a database system that you actually, you know, you want to get the best performance, you're typically running the database system on a dedicated machine without anything else running. Right? You're not running your Bitcoin mining uh, operation on the same machine that you run your uh, your database system. Unless you get that Postgres, bu Postgres bug that they had a few weeks ago. Yes? You mentioned what you mentioned latest tune. Wait, how did they tune? What do you mean? Like you mentioned latest tune. Like the problem. Say, say it again? What, sorry. Uh, you mentioned like the problem has fixed, has been fixed. Like how did they fix it? Or just don't run like on the system. Oh, sorry. I'm missing. Uh, yeah, like so if you run like a Bitcoin miner for us, like you say like the problem has been fixed, or the solution just like don't run it on the system. Yeah, the problem is not fixed. Hold on. Yeah, yeah. Like, like again, the op like, this thing, you're, you're setting where a, your thread in your process, the data system process, where your thread can run. Yeah. The operating system is going to let everybody else, because you know, it's trying to be a, a, a time-shared, multi-shared system. Mm -hmm. Any other process can start running on, on the, your system and can, can start using the cores that you're trying to dedicate here. And the, the answer is you just don't let people run non-database stuff on your, on your database machine. And the Postgres bug I was mentioning was a, um, was a few weeks ago. Someone had a malware where they would send you an image, and then if you're running Postgres, they were able to run a, install a Bitcoin miner inside of Postgres. All right, but that's, that's an anomaly. Yes? You have a question? Or? Oh. Okay. So again, this is the, the problem we're trying to solve here is we have a bunch of cores. We have a bunch of workers. How do we assign the workers to cores? The first one is you have a single worker per core. And again, it doesn't matter whether it's a process or a thread, right? Uh, and then this one is you have multiple workers per core. And essentially, you have a pool of workers. It doesn't, again, it could be a process, it could be threads, uh, running on a single core or a single socket. And, and then the system can decide if one guy gets blocked, then somebody else can run and make forward progress. And then the last issue we've got to deal with is how do we actually assign tasks now to these workers? And again, this should be pretty straightforward and easy to follow. There's basically a, a choice between push or pull. So in the push approach, you have this centralized coordinator or dispatcher that has a global view of all the tasks that, are, that, are, that has to run and what those workers are actually doing. And so what happens is you, your tasks come in. The, the dispatcher says, all right, this worker gets this task. This worker gets that task. And it can be aware of what data these tasks have to operate on, and it knows where the workers are assigned, what cores they're assigned to. So it tries to do a good job of assigning you know, tasks to workers that are going to operate on local data. And I'll describe what I mean by local data in a second. And then when the worker finishes, there's a callback mechanism, or they have a, a, a way to notify the dispatcher to say, hey, I'm done. Give me something else to do. The alternative is the pool-based approach, where you have some kind of uh, one or more task queues the workers are just always pulling that and saying, what's, what's the next thing I can do? What's the next thing I can do? Right? And they essentially block on that until, if there's nothing there, until something shows up. So now regardless of how we're going to assign, uh, decide where the workers are going to run at um, and how they're going to get the actual task they want to execute, as I said in the last slide, we want to make sure that our workers are always going to operate on local data. Right? So that means that the, the, the the scheduling mechanism, whatever it is that we're, how our system is, is, how our workers are getting tasks, we need to be aware of what the actual underlying layout of memory is and where how our database is split across or stored across that memory so that we're going to always read data that's local to us because that's going to be much faster. So this is going to be a, a distinction between what's called uniform memory access and non-uniform memory access. So the uniform memory access approach was very common in multi-socket architectures up until about 10 or 15 years ago. And the basic idea here is that uh, you had your CPU sockets, 
Each socket had its own local caches, like L1, L2, L3. And then the, there was this thing called the bus, the memory bus, where it would allow you to take requests for some uh, location in memory from any socket and retrieve it from any uh, bank of uh, DRAM DIMMs. Right? So if this thing wanted to read data over this DIMM over here, it would just you know, make a request to do the load to read that memory, memory uh, address, and then the bus would then route it here to get the data you need and then bring it back to you. So in this environment, the cost of accessing uh, data from any CPU to any other memory location or bank would always be the same because you always had to go through this bus. Right? I'm physically showing you that you know, potentially this thing is closer to this, but in practice, you don't know because the bus is sort of hiding that from you. Right? And you have to still do cache and validation in this environment. So if two guys, two sockets read the same memory address and they have their CPU caches, if this first socket uh, writes to it, then you have to send an invalidation message over the bus and back down here. Right? So the, the, the system makes sure, uses the bus to make sure everything is cache coherent. So again, in this environment, the cost of accessing data from any socket to any memory location was always going to be the same. So we didn't, need to, we didn't care about how our database would be stored across memory because any task running on any socket would have the same latency to read anything. But around 15 years ago, they switched to what's called the non-uniform memory access model. Right, so anytime you buy like a modern uh, Xeon CPU uh, and, and a multi-socket multi system, you're going to get something that looks like this. So now what happens is that every socket still has its local caches, but then they're also going to have a local uh, uh, memory bank or DRAM. And so the cost of accessing this DRAM here is, is really fast or much lower now because it's, it's local to you. It's right there. And any time you need to read data that's stored at another socket's uh, DRAM uh, or, or memory bank, you'd go over what's called the interconnect um, to send a message over to the socket. And the socket says, oh, you need this piece of memory. Let me go get it for you and then transfer it over. All right. So again, we're, we're talking, you know, um, this is really low latency, right? This is really fast. But the, the, the relative difference of performance going from here to here versus from here to over here uh, will be, will, can be significant. Yes. To back to the previous point. Yes. So even for like uniform memory access, would it be like faster if the socket is like fetch data from its local cache instead of like the one beside it? So your question is, um, if this socket has to read read an address in memory, it's not in its cache. Mm -hmm. It has to read it from up here, right? Can you split the cache from the cache? From this guy's cache? Like from its local cache. Well, no, no. So, so like. If it's in the cache, yeah, you just go read it. Yeah. If it's not in your cache, you got to go up here and get it. Yeah, so if this is the case, would it be faster than like comparing with reading the data from like another cache? Yeah, so the question is, instead of going up to memory, can you just go over here and get it, get it for the, the cache? Uh, in theory, yes, because cache is always much faster than, than, than DRAM. Uh, SRAM is always faster than DRAM. Um, I don't know actually whether they do this, because I don't know where there is... Like you'd have to have a, there's different cache coherence protocols. I think the most common one is like Snoopy or directory. So it's like somewhere it has to, somebody has to store, oh, the thing you want, yes, it's here, but it's also here. And I, and I don't know how they do that, so if, they even do, if they even do that. What's that? So it doesn't like make much difference. Like, this is super abstract. There's actually row buffers inside of this thing. There's cache inside DRAM as well. So this is all hidden from you in some ways, right? Like, so, so the thing is, like, it doesn't like make any difference even if you read from like another cache, would it be like three times faster? Or... His question is, would it still be is like how much faster would it be reading from, this guy reading from this cache versus up here? Yeah, I mean, like, would localness like make sense in this case? Lo localness makes sense in like terms of, like. If you're long, long as you're reading from your cache, you're fine. Then this one's outside your cache. You got to go with the bus, and then that's a whole other mess, right? Yes. Just making sure that the reason why the bus matters is because it's like basically everything must be measured in bus round trip because it doesn't get 
Doesn't care if you're, uh, yeah, so his, so his, yeah, his statement is, um, the reason why the bus sucks is because, like, once you're on it, like, it doesn't matter where you're going, there's, there's sort of this, always this round trip cost that you have to incur with this, and that's the high pull in the tent, yes. Going through the bus is always bad. Um, it has limited bandwidth. Right, in the case of this one, uh, you have point-to-point -point connection between the different sockets, so there's not a common bus uh, that everyone has to get on and, and use, right? You, this guy can talk to this guy at the same time this guy is talking to this guy, and there's no interference between the two of them. So in uh, Intel, this is called, up in, uh, starting in 2008, it's called the Quick Path Interconnect. As of last year, now they call this the Ultra Path Connect, Interconnect. Uh, in the case of AMD, I don't know when they started doing this, but they called theirs the Hypertransport, and then now as of 2017 with the new Ryzen chips, they call this the Infinity Fabric. Um, I tried looking to see what power does. Um, they have a code name called, I think it's called the Mac Interconnect, which I, I, didn't, I couldn't see how they do it in, in, in power. But it, this is basically how everyone builds now the uh, multi-socket architectures. And again, from a database perspective, again, the key thing that's going to matter is that if we can read data from our, our local, local DRAM, our local memory, then that's good. Having to go to the interconnect is, is bad. Yes? Is the architecture for the current uh, mainframe only, or is it also available in the laptop? So his question is, is this the architecture used in mainframes? Mainframe, don't use the word mainframe, like servers. Uh, but it's also used in laptops. If your laptop has multi-sockets, which it, it probably doesn't, then yes, right? Uh, most desktops don't have multi-sockets either. This is like, you know, if you buy like a Xeon server, it's going to have this, this setup. Every multi-socket uh, system based on AMD or Xeon or, or AMD or, A or Intel or, or, or IBM is going to have this interconnect. As far as I know, nobody does the bus. They might do it in an uh, embedded environment, but even then, those guys aren't gonna, aren't, probably aren't going to run multi-socket. Okay. So the Numa architecture is going to make our life more tricky. Right? It's going to make system develop, development more tricky for us, right? because before with, with the, the uniform memory access, our system could just call malloc, and we didn't care where the operating system actually put the data, right? because it just came back and says, here's our memory, and we don't actually care where it's physically stored because we know the bus is always going to be uh, a problem for us. But now with NUMA, we have to actually care. So the, the, the question we've got to deal with is, how are we actually going to control this in, in our database system? Um, and the, the operating systems actually provide us some, some, uh, some features or, 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 or methods we can invoke to actually control where, where it's actually going to put memory. So the idea here is that we're going to take our database and we're going to, we're going to partition it to disjoint subsets. Again, in the NoSQL world, they call this shards. In the, in the hyper paper, they call them morsels. Same idea. But we're going to take these disjoint subsets of the database, and we're going to assign them to, uh, to different CPUs so that they can store them in, on their local, local memory. And then internally, we're going to track the locations of these partitions so that when it comes time to actually schedule tasks, we can, we can have the operator instances that, that are going to operate on data uh, we want, we'll assign them to, to workers that can then operate on the data that's local to them. That you don't have to go to the interconnect and get data from another socket. That you can invoke your, your portion of the query on the data that, that's local to you. In the back. Uh, what's like the ratio of speed between like going to your local memory and then going over to the bus? This question is, what is the ratio of uh, speed going from local memory to, to over the bus? Or uh, over the interconnect? Um, I, I, don't, I don't know exact numbers, but I'll, I'll, we'll show experiments of how, you know, how this affects performance. It depends on what the query is actually trying to do. Yeah, yes? I think it's like three times. He says it might be three times the difference. I mean, we can look this up later. That's a good question. I should know that, though. Um, I just know it's bad, and you should avoid it. So, uh, this is a, this, so this idea of keeping track of where the data is actually being stored and making sure that we execute queries on local data, this is an old, old problem in databases. Uh, especially in distributed databases, this is called data placement. So the way to think about this is data partitioning is deciding what attribute or at the logical level you want to divide the, the, the tables up. 
And then data placement is how do you actually now take those partitions and assign them to some location so that you maximize the locality of, of, of the data that, that the queries are processing. So the way we can handle this in Linux is through the, uh, the, the libc instruction called move pages. So if you invoke move pages with just a memory address, uh, it'll come back with the number of the NUMA region that that memory address is located on. Um, but then if you give it a, a memory address plus a, a NUMA region, right, CPU ID, then it'll actually go ahead and move that data for you, All right? So now we got to talk about, though, this is fine for once the data has already been created, but is there a way for us, for us to control where the data, uh, sorry, this, is, this allows us to control the data after it's been created, but the question is, is there a way to control where the data is being placed at the moment that we're creating it? So the question is, how, what happens at when we actually call malloc in our system, right? So assume that you know, we're running JE malloc, TC malloc, or libc malloc, doesn't matter which one. Um, assume that, that our data system is calling malloc because we want to allocate memory for a new, a new block of data. Um, and then the allocator doesn't have a free chunk for us, so it has, it has to get memory from, from the OS. Does anyone know what, what, what actually happens here? Yes? So he says the OS zeroes out a frame, then hands it back to the allocator because it makes sure that you don't see data that, that somebody else wrote to. Uh, actually, no. Not yet. Right, but assume you don't have you don't assume you don't have more free space. Then you given the S break so that you get more memory from the, uh, from the OS. Yes, but is that but what kind of memory is that? Virtual memory. Virtual memory. Virtual memory. Yes. So yeah. So the answer is actually nothing, right? Uh, so it's exactly as he says. The allocator goes into the, the operating system and says, I need more memory. So the operating system is going to extend the logical or virtual memory address space for uh, our process. Um, but this virtual memory is not backed by any physical memory at this point. So we haven't done what he's doing. He's, he's talking about where we zeroed out the memory. Uh, it's just saying, yeah, you got to go ahead and, and, and do whatever you want with it. It's only when the, the, the process then tries to actually access that memory, we would hit a page fault. Then it has to find a new a new new block of data, zero it out, and then handle it back to the uh, the the process for us. So, but again, my question is though, where is this memory actually going to be stored? Uh, and it depends. So after the page fault, the the operating system has to decide, you know, what NUMA region or what socket am I going to store this data? And the two approaches are to just let the operating system do interleaving where they just do a round-robin approach and allocate memory from one socket to the next to the next, right? Just go around so that way everything's sort of spread out evenly. Um, but there's also a way to pass in a flag uh, to, under NUMA control to say that it's wherever the data, wherever thread that actually tries to access the data, whatever, whatever socket it's running at, then that's where I'm going to allocate it. So again, when I call malloc, the data is actually not allocated yet, right? I just get back virtual memory. But then when someone actually tries to touch it, uh, with this approach, is wherever the thread is that's touching it that caused the page fault, that's where the uh, CPU will actually, the, the, the operating system will actually pin, you know, pin that piece of memory. Yes? Actually, I'm curious about how virtual memory will work in the setup. Is, is like every processor core has its own uh, virtual memory management and it's filled up to disk whenever that second is full? Or can you actually you know, say, oh, my, virtual, uh, my, my physical memory is full, let me direct this to some other system? So the question is, how does actually virtual memory work in a multi-socket environment? I don't know the answer. Yeah. Um, I think it would be the same uh, as the single... Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, so I think every, every socket still has its own TLB. Uh, but then you know, the virtual address is just... Because it's a single address space across all the DIMMs. Mm -hmm. So you just you have the, 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 the page table is always the same. Right? It's just... Now some of it might be stored in one DIM versus another. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So again, this is something you you can pass in when your process is created uh, under NUMA control to tell it to do this, and then and this is what you get in in the by the OS by default. 
So to sort of answer his question, maybe not with exactly exact numbers, but showing you examples of how this, this affects a database system, I want to show two experiments where they're going to run on a multi-socket environment for an OLTV workload and an OLAP workload, and you see what the performance difference is for uh, if you're careful about the, new, the placement of data in NUMA regions versus just letting the OS or just letting random things happen. So in this first experiment here, uh, this is from the, the researchers at EPFL, and they took uh, SureMT, and they're going to run the payment transaction in, from TPCC under four uh, uh, thread placement configurations. So the idea here is that the, the, the data would be spread across um, uh, these different NUMA regions, and then the, the red dots correspond to where the, uh, where the workers are actually going to run. So under spread, you have, uh, you have one thread, uh, one thread per, per socket. Under group, you have all four threads running in one socket. Under mix, you have two up here, two down here. And the last one, OS, is just letting the operating system just do everything. And so in this case here, on a group, it gets the best performance because when they load the data, everything's going to land on this socket here. So they're all operating on, on their, local, on, on their you know, local memory. Whereas under spread, it the, does the worst because the data is being spread out across multiple DIMMs. And therefore, when these threads start accessing data that's not remote to, or not local to them, they have to send messages over the interconnect to get the data that they need. And the mix is sort of like a half approach, where it's like half the data is at the first socket, half the data is at the bottom socket. And in case of the operating system, it tries to do a, bit, a good job of saying, oh, well, I think my, 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 my cores are accessing this data, so maybe I want to mi start migrating threads. Uh, it does a little bit better than spread, but it doesn't do as well as, as group. So in the case of the payment transaction, it doesn't touch that much data um, compared to an OLAP query. Right? It is updating the database, though. But this just shows you under an OLTV environment, Again, you, you can get a performance difference, and the grouping one turns out to be the best. But you see a bigger performance difference under OLAP. So this is an experiment that a former master student in, in took this class and, and worked on our research team did about two years ago, where they built a sort of real simplistic uh, query processing engine uh, that just stored everything as arrays. And they were going to run this on a uh, eight-socket machine in the PDL, where the first one the red line would show that the threads only process data that's local to it. And then the, the, the one at the bottom would be every thread was going to be processing any, some random chunk of data that could be stored on, on any, any, any possible socket. So the, the vertical line here represents when we run out of hardware threads, and now we're into hyper-threading. So it's, uh, it's eight sockets, 10, 10 cores per socket. So there's 100, so there's 80 real uh, hardware threads, and then everything after here is all hyper-threading. So that's why both of them are, are going to flat line. So from this, you see there's, there's a pretty significant difference. Uh, I forget what the exact numbers is. This is roughly about 250,000, and this flat line is just above 100,000. So we're getting about a 2x performance difference when we're careful about our, where our threads are reading their data versus we just let random things happen. So he said it was roughly about 3x performance difference, and then this is, this is, this is less than that. Um, and as I said, because it, it depends on a bunch of other stuff that's going on in the system while we're running. All right, and the reason why the lines are close up to a point and then it converges is because we are using the, the, the same database size for every single experiment. We're just having more threads execute, ex execute and process it. So when you have fewer number of threads, the probability that the thread's going to end up reading data that's local to it is, is much higher, but then as you divide the work up more across more threads, then the probability goes lower, and then you, that's why it, it flatlines. So again, the, the, the two things we've got to worry about are partitioning and placement. With partitioning, that's again, that's how we're dividing up the, the tables uh, based on some logical attribute and assign them to, uh, to, to chunks or morsels. And again, there's standard approach to do range partitioning, hash partitioning, or replication. The things we're sort of worried about here is how to do placement. It's about how do we decide how to, uh, to where we tell the data system to actually store these partitions after we, we divide it up. And then, how, and then we need to make sure that we can then identify where this data is, is being stored and assign tasks to operate on, on the cores that have data local to it. So at this point in the class, 
what do we have so far? We have the process model. We have how we're going to allocate uh, workers. Um, we have how we're going to assign tasks to, 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 ex to execute on this data. And then we have uh, how we're going to split up the data and store it or place it on, on different sockets. Um, but now we still got to deal with the problem of how we take a bunch of tasks uh, from a logical query plan and figure out how many we actually want and be able to execute them. So as I said in the beginning, this is relatively easy to do in an OLTP workload because the queries are so simple. They process, uh, you know, one, you know, they try to go retrieve one, one tuple. So there isn't really any opportunity to parallelize them. So in this environment, it'd be one query equals one task. Uh, for OLAT queries, this is where things get more challenging. And I will say also too, this is essentially what the, the focus is going to be on in this class for the next remaining weeks about how do we actually ex execute OLAP queries, doing hash joins, sort merge joins, and vectorized execution. Um, because this is much harder to do because we have to process a lot of data. Yes? Isn't it maybe better to put like a single transaction as a work unit? Because like there's probably some sort of a between inside a transaction of multiple queries. So his, his statement is, for all uh, to be queries, would it make sense to make the, 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 the task be a transaction rather than a single query? Um, It depends, right? So it's a lot of times in OTP workloads, the output of one query could be used as the input for the next query. So you can't schedule the, the, the next guy before you execute the first one, right? Furthermore, if you're not running with stored procedures, you don't know, you may not know what all the queries you're going to execute, right? Uh, you can get batches in JDBC of queries, but again, you have to execute them in serial order unless, they're, unless you can figure out there's no dependencies between them. Um, as far as I know, everyone executes uh, simple queries like this as a single task unit, right? Because th there's too much overhead of trying to like break it up and to parallelize it for something that's so simple. Like you can't parallelize. I mean, for some things you can, but and typically you can't parallelize a, an index probe to get a single tuple, right? One thread's going to do it. it. Doesn't make sense to do multiple threads. All right. Uh, so the. The easiest way to do this is to do what's called static scheduling. Um, and this is just we say that uh, we, 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 ahead of time, we fix the number of threads we're going to execute the query when we generate the plan. And it could be something really simple, like I have, I have 10 threads or 10 workers, I'll have 10 tasks, and just, and, just, and just shove them out. And then as things change, or as you're executing the query, you don't reassess whether you want to divide this up or have more, more, more or less parallelism. You just go with whatever, whatever you uh, selected at the beginning. Typically, this is what most people do, and this is what we currently do in our, in our own system, right? Because we just say, I know I have 10 cores, let me just make 10 tasks. So the then we get, so this brings us to the paper that you guys read about morsels. And the idea here is that this is a dynamic scheduling approach where we're going to generate more tasks than we have uh, worker threads, and we're going to spread them across uh, you know, uh, the, the different workers we have, and then as they execute, if one guy goes really fast, he's able to process more data or process more tasks more quickly than other ones. And we don't have to worry about uh, reassessing or, or, or reassigning tasks to workers. Right? They, they can steal work from other people. So under Hyper, they're going to use uh, one worker per core. They're going to use a pool-based task assignment. And then they're going to assign morsels to uh, sockets just using our, uh, in a round-robin fashion. And so, in the actual implementation of Hyper, right, of, 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 the, of, the, of the operators in, in the system, the physical operators, like the join, join operator, uh, they're going to have support to do parallel numaware execution of these things, right? Because they're going to net the know, I, this task needs to operate on this data uh, because it's local to it, so I'll make sure that it runs over there. So, at a high level, what's going on is that they're not going to have a separate dispatcher thread. Uh, because they're using a pool-based model, right? Um, but then all the threads are going to pull a centralized queue, and the paper talks about implement implementing this as a lock-free hash table, which we'll cover uh, next class. And then what will happen is that uh, the threads are essentially doing what is called cooperative scheduling because they break up the query plan in a bunch of different tasks. That all goes into a single queue, and each worker thread is, is just pulling this, this, work this queue trying to figure out what the next thing to do, but they give a preference or higher priority to selecting tasks that are, are local to it, 
um, or that operate on data that's local to it. But then if those tasks aren't available, then it just goes find any, any task, right? Um, so this essentially allows them to do like the, the, you know, the, the straggler uh, handling that like Hadoop does. If you notice that one thread is running slower than everyone else, maybe you can al you'll also execute its same task because uh, for whatever reason that, that core is having problems and maybe you'll be able to finish it up more quickly than, uh, than what it, it could do. So essentially this, this is also called work stealing. So let's look at a high level like this. So say we have a single data table and we need to split this up in, into morsels, right? And again, just think of this as like sort of horizontal partitioning of the, uh, of the table. So in the paper they talk about the, using 100,000 tuples per morsel uh, gave the right amount of parallelism um, without having uh, morsels that be too large and cause bottlenecks because you know one thread might choke on this and, or, on a morsel and it's take a long time to process it. Um, in Peloton, we use the thousand tuples per block. Um, we pick this number at random. We haven't done any validation to say whether that's a good idea. Uh, in HDOR, we use 10 megabytes of tuples per block. And again, we picked this number at random. It seemed good enough. We never actually did validation on it. All right, so now what's going to happen is, all right, and then again, these, these morsels will all be assigned to uh, different sockets in the system. So now we're going to actually execute our query. Uh, we're going to take our query plan, and then we're going to generate a bunch of, of tasks for it. Right? So we have our scans on A, scans on B, and then actually doing the join here. And so at each socket now, we're going to have the, our, our local memory, and then we're going to store inside of it the morsels for, uh, that we, just, we got from the table we just split up before. But then we're also going to have these local buffers that we're, the, the worker threads are going to use to stage or write out the output of, of the, the task that they're executing. So these are, these are local to them, but they're not private, meaning they're allowed to read the buffers from other, other, other sockets. But the idea here is that you can, you're always writing out the, the results of the, of the task you're processing on data that's local to you, and then the, you have to coalesce them later on depending on what the, what the query plan is actually trying to do. All right, so let's say that we start off, I'm gonna start scheduling these things. So what'll happen is the, you take the first task here, the first set of tasks, and again, each, each core will try to pick, a worker at running at a core, we'll try to pick data that's local to it. So this is processing on, a, on, on the segment A1, or the morsel A1, and that's local to, to processor A1. And this is, this is processing uh, morsel A2, and that's local to, to process two, and so forth. So now, uh, right, and so there's, there's, they're reading data that's local to it, so we don't need to coordinate across these different, different sockets. And as they produce output, they're writing their output to, to the local buffer. So now let's say that uh, the first two cores, they finish up, but for whatever reason, A3 is, is, is still running. Um, so let's say that now we could start working on the, the, the other side of, of, the, of the, the join and start processing B1 and B2. And again, they're pulling data that's, that's local to the IP. Um, and we still haven't had to do any cross communication with this. So now at this point here, let's say A1 finishes. Um, it could go on and execute B3 and say it finishes that real quickly. Um, but now in this case here, because it is B3 is stored over socket three, we're gonna have to move data over uh, the interconnect in order to actually process it here. But the output of this operator will again go into our local buffer. So we're not writing out the output of this into this guy's buffer, we're just always writing it uh, locally. Again, internally, the system keeps, keeps does all this bookkeeping to keep track of, oh, this task executed this socket, therefore the data that this task generated can be stored at what well, we found at this socket here, right? It's not like you always got to go to, to whatever the, the, the data corresponded to that you read will be found at, at its buffer. It's always stored at wherever the, 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 the core that actually processed it. So this is sort of clear. They're taking tasks. Uh, they try to prefer things that are, that are local to it, but they're allowed to go get data from, uh, get tasks that, are, that have data that's stored somewhere else in the back. Uh, who distributes the morsels to the so his, so his question is, who distributes the morsels to different CPUs? So when you load the data, right, they, they divide it up into 100,000 chunks, 100, chunks of 100,000 tuples, 
and then it's assigned at, 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 the, at the moment you create the morsel. All right? Yes? In a round robin way. In a round robin way, yes. And the buffer is essentially a chunk of memory. His question is, 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 a, is, a, is a morsel like a chunk of local memory? Like oh, the, yeah. The buffer is yeah, this local memory, it's a chunk of local memory that this socket can, can write into. It will be the only writer. Uh, it will be the only reader. At this point, yes, there could have other queries. Like if you have an exchange operator, you may need to read from the different buffers and put things together. But for this this purpose here, there's no no other thread is going to write into this or read from it. So I don't need to do any coordination. So is like the stealing of morsels from a different uh, from a different like partition or whatever. Um, yeah, so, so to be clear, this is only makes sense for OLAP, right? And this is, again, this is like an ephemeral yeah. result from the, op from the execution of the operator. If you were doing an update, you'd have to write it back down to the mor where the morsels are, because that this like this is the actual table at the bottom. Yes. Who exactly does the bookkeeping? So this question is who exactly does the bookkeeping? Yeah. Uh, there's like a again a global data structure. The execution context of the query, you would know. All right, I executed this task at this core, so therefore here's the memory location to go get the result if you want if you need it. So it's like something like a master stream. No, no, it's like it's just internal state of the system. There's no, there's no dispatcher threat managing this, right? They're all, they're doing it cooperatively. Okay. All right. So just to, to reiterate what's going on, all right? Since uh, there's only one worker per core, uh, they have to use work stealing because otherwise, if if we were back here. And if this guy's not allowed to steal work, then, then this core is just sitting idle because only socket three can process any task that process, you know, that operates on a morsel that's looked to it. So and without work stealing, this thing would be idle. So the way the way they resolve that is allow you to go and jump to the queue. If you don't see anything that you can process locally, then you go and try to get something that is remote. And that's better than doing nothing. And as I said, they maintain a lock-free hash table as the work queue that everybody's pulling from. Um, but we'll discuss all about uh, hash tables on, on Wednesday's class. So the other approach I, I, I like to discuss is what SAP HANA does. So I, sh I should clarify here. So there's, this is a paper from uh, the LDB 2015. Um, it was written by a student in Europe uh, that worked on SAP HANA as part of like an internship, or I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what the setup was. But as far as I know, this is not actually what HANA does. This is sort of like a prototype or fork of the HANA system, and they explored this, uh, um, this different architecture. So what HANA's going to do is they're going to do a pool-based scheduling, but instead of having a single uh, worker per core, they're going to have pools of workers per socket. And the there's actually going to be multiple pools or groups, as they call them, per CPU. And each of these groups are going to have two queues. They're going to have a soft queue and a hard queue. So the soft queue basically says that any other thread running in the system is allowed to steal tasks from any other group's soft queue. But in the case of the hard queue, uh, you, no one is allowed to steal that. Like the only the, 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 the workers that are assigned to that pool are allowed to execute it. Right, so the hard queue would be something like a um, if you want to have a garbage collection thread or a networking thread where you don't want you know anybody to preempt you, then you you put that in the hard queue. But any other task could be uh, be could be put in the soft queue. So this, this what's really interesting about this paper is that all of the threads in the system uh, in in this version of Hana are organized in in these in these worker pools or thread thread groups and and they can they're allowed to steal work from anybody else so this includes things like like networking logging uh, any background task is going to be going to be managed in, in this environment in the case of hyper they actually do what we currently do 
is where you have your dedicated worker threads that only execute tasks or they execute queries, but then you just have a scattering of a bunch of other threads that are doing other background tasks or networking tasks, um, and they don't ever commingle. Right? A networking thread can never do uh, any ex execute a query, and any any worker thread can never execute like logging or or uh, garbage collection. Right? So in the case of of for this HANA system, the way they're going to sort of demand, try to manage everything is that they're going to have this watchdog thread that's going to run in the background and essentially go and look and check to see how much uh, how much work or how long are the queues for the different worker threads, and then can assign tasks dynamically and then also scale up and scale down the number of threads that each group is allowed to have. And so the way again the way they do this is that they have these soft and hard priority queues. Um, and then for the different thre uh, threads in each group, they'll have these flags to say what the thread's allowed to do. All right? you, you say that the thread is essentially the status is allowed to be working, it's inactive because it's blocked on something, uh, it's free, meaning it ha it's allowed to sleep for a little bit, they wake up and see whether it's a new task to do, or park basically means like stopping it from ever actually executing uh, a new task. So they're not actually killing threads, they're just sort of saying, you, you, you shouldn't be scheduled, don't do anything, or you're allowed, allowed to try to execute and do work. So now, this sounds like overly complicated, and this sounds a lot like an operating system, right? Sounds like an operating system scheduler. And so the reason why they want to do this is because the HANA guys claim, according to this paper, is that when you start scaling up to a large number of sockets, so I think in the paper they're, they're talking about eight, eight CPU sockets, whereas the hyper guys are only maybe looking at two sockets, but when you start looking at a large, having a large number of sockets across with a large number of cores, letting the operating system maybe kind of manage these things itself becomes problematic, and it's, the data system is going to do a much better job at doing this. And furthermore, they're also going to say that uh, the, and if you end up stealing tasks in the same way that the, the hyper guys do, that becomes a big performance bottleneck as well, and you're better off uh, not allowing thread to steal from, uh, from the soft queues and just make everything be a hard queue. So with their numerware scheduler, they're going to allow it to, again, adjust the number of threads uh, where they're running at by pinning them based on whether the, the, they recognize that a task is going to be CPU bound or memory bound. Um, again, some tasks will just don't actually have to read any data, like uh, I don't know, if, you're, if you're crunching some, some computation in, in the UDF. So maybe you want to let that run on any, any CPU. But again, if you're reading data uh, from the tables that are, is placed in different NUMA regions, then maybe you want to be memory bound, and then you pin your, sock, pin your threads to sockets based on that. And again, they found that the, the, the work stealing approach from Hyper was not beneficial for uh, when you scale up the, the, the largest number of sockets. I was at a, um, a, a SAP, SAP HANA seminar, this was two years ago, um, and they talked about one of their customers was maxing out the total amount of memory uh, available on Intel CPUs, right? Even though Intel has 64-bit addresses, it's actually two to the 48 addresses, and they had some customer maxing out that amount, right? And they, they had a crazy number of, of, of sockets in this, this machine. So in that environment, uh, the work stealing was not, the, was, was not beneficial, not, not good for you. Uh, and so instead, the way you're going to do this is that uh, well, at a high level, what I like about this is because, again, everything is managed under this threading architecture or th threading infrastructure. And so the threads in the system can just not only execute queries, but they can execute other things, and the system can tune that up and down at, at, as needed. Yes? So what time and how would we get like, uh, something in our queues? Say it again, what time what? And what time and how will we get like, something in our queues? What do you mean? What, what do you mean? What time? Like uh, before execution. Really so the, the the system the system boots up. It hasn't done anything yet. It, it it establishes these hard and soft queues, right? Like you create these 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 thread groups, and every thread group has these two two queues, and then when you execute queries, you can decide the the system can decide whether I put the tasks for that query in either a soft queue or a hard queue. Or if there's other background threads you want to run, like garbage collection, those things are just tasks, but then can be, again, assigned to a hard queue or a soft queue. Why they were building two different queues? 
because some tasks, his question is why would it be two different queues? Some tasks you may want to allow other threads to steal the, the, the work from one group to another. That would be the soft queue. And then the hard queue would be things you don't can't steal. But as they said, when you, when you have a large number of sockets, it's better to put everything as, as in the hard queue. Yeah, what you just say again, like why this question is why does why doesn't doesn't it scale? Uh, I have to go read the paper again. Uh, I think the it was the coordination and synchronization across uh, different 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 the different sockets or different different workers, and then the it, I think in a really large memory environment now the cost of 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 not processing data local to you becomes more more worse and worse. So you're just better off just just letting you know these these sockets have enough cores that you can probably get through the data uh, fast enough. So there's not going to be just, everyone's not going to be bottlenecked on on some large task, right? That you can sort of spread things out, out enough and have enough smaller chunks, and there's enough cores that to to parallelize at a single socket. I think that was the gist of what they what they argued. Yes. The priority is already calculated before execution. The what the priority. Oh, for, for these hard queues or soft queues? Yeah, like, like again, internally the system knows, all right, I'm, these tasks are just generated to execute this query. They go into the soft queue. This task I'm, I'm, I'm generating now to do garbage collection pass, that goes in the hard queue. So, like, who's responsible for determining that? Us. People that, us building, building a data system. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, what am I take, what are my takeaways to this? So, Everything I've described today sounds like an operating system, right? We talked about tasks having priorities. We talked about controlling where the data is stored. Uh, we talked about assigning threads, to, uh, tasks to threads. Uh, that's essentially what the operating system does for us, right? With with, with schedulers. Um, but because the database system knows exactly what your data is you're trying to do, uh, then it. It's going to be in the best position to make decisions about how to execute these tasks, or for the, either the query or other parts of the system. And the key thing that we have to make sure we, we handle correctly in order to get this better performance is that we have to be aware of what our hardware actually looks like and make sure that we put our data in the right place and then our tasks then execute on data that's local to it. Right? Yes. Yeah, actually on that note, you said in the 80s people actually built machines dedicated to databases, but it's not worth it because Moore's Law. So Moore's Law is no longer a thing. Why hasn't that happened again? No, that, like... Okay, so his statement is that I claim that in the 1980s, I don't think I claim this in this class, but I've said it before, well, and this is just... It's just true. So in the 1980s, there was this movement called called database machines. So if, if people don't know this, think of a database, database machine as a special appliance, like a one you know one unit rack server that had hardware that was dedicated to execute nothing but databases, right? They're all, only a, a database system. Um, and then they it, it, it was thought that this is how people were going to build database systems going forward. Everyone's always had the specialized hardware. But then it never panned out because by the time it took you to, to, to spec out, design, and build a database machine, Intel or whoever else was putting out CPUs at the time, Moore's Law caught up enough where all the advantage you got from specialized hardware could be beaten by commodity hardware that, that improved over time. So database machines, there was a couple companies, they all, they all went under. And, and so now here his claim is uh, because Moore's Law is essentially over, and the only way that we're getting better performance now is through scaling out with multiple cores. Is it the case that we should we take a second look at dedicated hardware for specialized hardware for data systems? Or even just a dedicated OS. Dedicated OS. Um, that's a whole other conversation. Um, so in terms of dedicated hardware, let's start with that. Uh, there actually are some companies now actually starting to build Specialized ASICs and FPGAs. Um, I mean, Tiza was around in the early 2000s. They had an FPGA to do predicate pushdown in databases. Um, Oracle now uses similar things um, in Exadata. I don't think that we'll ever have the case in my lifetime that we'll have 
in the same way they had database machines building super specialized hardware for 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 databases uh i don't think we'll, we'll go back to that the trend now will be uh using what are called hardware accelerators to speed up some 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 aspect of the database system so for those of you that aren't graduating i'll announce this later in the semester but in fall 2018 we're having a database seminar on all hardware accelerated databases so gpu databases uh, fpga databases right so that that's an example of having sort of specialized hardware to do one thing, not like a whole system to build explicitly for databases. Then your next statement is, could we have an operating system that could be uh, explicitly tuned for a database system or designed to do nothing but a database system? Yeah, basically remove the layers. Yes. Um, that would be, yeah, so you would probably get a, you, you would get a performance improvement, but the software engineering cost to do that would not be worth it. Um, so one good example would be uh, the file system layer can get in the way of things. So in the 80s, of course, uh, people tried actually writing database systems that actually operate directly on the bare metal of the disk and essentially build their own file system themselves. Uh, I think Oracle or IBM will still ship you with something that does that, but the software engineering overhead of that versus just using ext4 is totally not worth it. You may get like a, I think Sternberger said like a 15% gain is what they measured back in the 80s. And all the overhead of having to disk manage it yourself wasn't worth that 15%. So I, I, don't, I don't think the, the specialized databases or specialized operating systems for databases is, is worth, worth, worth it. Now, can you have a, like a microkernel modular thing that you can put in the pieces just you need for the data database? That's another story. All right, any other questions? So again, this is an example where the operating system is there, it's a frenemy, we'll deal with it, but we, we can be smart about what we can do of scheduling our tasks and moving and, and placing data in a way that's much smarter than the operating system could ever do and get better performance. All right, so next class, we're doing hash joins. So there'll be two lectures on joins. The first one will be parallel hash joins, then we'll do parallel sort merge joins. So the paper I'm having you guys read, I actually really, really like. It is a uh, thorough evaluation of, of a bunch of different design decisions you have in hash joins. Uh, so we'll cover hash tables, hash functions, and, um, and scheduling these things. And then on Monday next week, we'll, we'll see how to do parallel sort merge. And this is the longstanding debate in databases, although you'll see who the winner is when you read the paper, right? What's faster, hash joins or sort merge joins? Right, there's a bunch of papers that, over the years that go back and forth, say one's better than the other. Uh, but there, there is a clear winner now. Okay? Any questions? Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting. Too cold, a whole bowl like Smith and Wesson. One court and my thoughts hip hop related. Write a rhyme and my pen's intoxicated. Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor. Since I'm a city slicker, brain waves are quicker. Rhymes I create rotate at a way too quick to duplicate. Fill a breeze as I skate. Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold it real tight. When I'm in flight, then we ignite. Blood starts to boil. I heat up the party for you. Let my girl rub me and my mic down with oil Wreck still turns with third degree burns for one man I heat up your brain, give it a suntan So just cool, let the temperature rise To cool it off with St. Ives